and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. The show you're about to hear is part three of our five-part O'Reilly AI New York series, sponsored by Intel Nirvana. I'm very grateful to them for helping make this series possible, and I'm excited about the cool stuff they launched at the O'Reilly AI conference, including version 2.0 of their Neon framework and their new Nirvana graph project. Be sure to check them out at intelnirvana.com. And if you haven't already listened to the first show in this series, where I interview Naveen Rao, who leads Intel's newly formed AI products group, and Hanlin Tang, an algorithms engineer on that team, it's Twimmel Talk number 31, and you definitely want to start there. My guest for this episode is Ben Vigoda. Ben is the founder and CEO of Gamelon, a DARPA-funded startup working on Bayesian program synthesis. We dive into what exactly this means and how it enables what Ben calls idea learning in this show. Note that Ben and I go pretty deep in this discussion, so I'm issuing the nerd alert. All right, everyone, on to the show. Hey everyone, I am here with Ben Vigoda of Gamelon, and I've been meaning to catch up with Ben for a long time. And I was just telling him before we got started about how we do these nerd alerts now. And he's like, oh, I'm going full nerd alert on this show. So <laughs> uh, if you like the nerd alert, you're probably going to enjoy this show. So Ben, why don't we start by talking a little bit about your background and sure. what you're doing, the company, all that stuff. My background, well, that that requires a full nerd alert, a super full <laughs> nerd, nerd alert. Well, I was an MIT PhD, and I was actually in a physics group. Second today. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, so <laughs> physics is a good background, especially statistical physics, and a lot actually at Gamelon, a lot of our a lot of folks there are from a physics background as well. I was a, kind of obsessed, actually, with machine learning and AI really? stuff back in high school and middle school. And um, wow, I was lucky enough to get a few audiences with a few of my heroes. Okay, and uh, some of them recommended that I went go into physics. So that's what I that's what I did. It's kind of it's like if you want to learn how to play rock guitar, where you go study jazz so or classical, so you have good chops or something. Okay, so you know, it's that kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, so that's my background. Did a postdoc and uh, was a visiting scientist at MIT for a little while. And then okay. I founded my – my first company was – we called them probability processors. So they're microchips. Okay. And it was really the first microchip architecture, first processor for machine learning you know, okay. before kind of GPUs and mm -hmm. before the Google Tensor Processor Unit. We created a sparse, dense tensor processing coprocessor. Oh, wow. About five years actually before the TPU, Google okay. TPU. So that's in, uh, it's in a bunch of stuff that's in like every cell phone call you place probably goes through one of those because mm. it's in most like cell phone towers okay, or a lot of them. And it's in cars and oh, wow. might be going into the Amazon Echo. So it's it's in a bunch of places. And is that company still going or was it they licensed got out or acquired? It got acquired, yeah. Okay. So, so that's kind of the basis of, you know, it's a big part of analog devices now, which okay. is the company that acquired us. Big Boston-based Boston, Boston -based semiconductor yep. company. Yeah, one of the best semiconductor companies and definitely the best one in Boston. <laughs> 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 so, you know, but through that experience, you know, we, we always thought, you know, if we're going to have these processors, we got to make them easy to program. Right. And so we came up with what we call probabilistic programming. Okay. And, you know, back then you could kind of count on two hands the other people who thought they were working on probabilistic programming. We were uh -huh. a small cult. We all knew each other. Now it's just exploded. But, you know, we, we built one of the first industrial scale probabilistic programming systems and compiler systems. Back around the same time, Microsoft was building infer.net, okay. which they used. I don't know that one. Oh, you don't know that one? Yeah. So, you know, it was used to prototype some cool stuff for, for gamers. It matches like Xbox people. Like if you're an Xbox player, it'll, right. they used infer.net to build a, a machine learning model that'll find you really good people to play against. Oh, wow. Okay. Who are like kind of well matched to your skill level. Yeah. And uh, it's called TrueScale. And they also did some stuff for Bing that I heard about. I'm okay. obviously not an expert on all the things they did internally, sure. but yeah. So that that's kind of where I came from, kind of my background. And were you in the keynote this morning here at O'Reilly? I didn't get did a chance you, to catch it. It was uh, 
I forget the name, Jonathan, I think from MIT, a uh, professor there at CSAIL was talking about some of the work that they were doing was that involved probabilistic programming. Oh, maybe uh, Professor Josh Tenenbaum. Josh Tenenbaum. Good yeah. friend. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. He came to my talk and then we were, we're hoping to get to work together some more. Oh, nice. But we have great reverence for, for what those folks do in, in their lab at MIT. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of cross-fertilization there. Also, one of his former postdocs, Noah Goodman, who's now a professor at Stanford, okay. is a real leader in this field. There's a few others. David Blyatt at Columbia here in New York. Okay. So, so probabilistic programming seems like a good thing to dig into, but I don't think we got to what Gamelon is up to. Well, Gamelon started as the largest investment by DARPA in probabilistic programming Okay. over the last few years. And thus, you can't really talk about any of the things you're doing? <laughs> no, of course we can. Of course we can. No, we're what, what they call uh, 6.1, technology readiness level one, which is basically okay. academic and commercial research. Okay. You know, so we, we basically set out to make it really easy for data scientists or human statisticians or modelers to create large-scale complex Bayesian models and solve them mm -hmm. with data. And then kind of had this breakthrough where we realized with the tools we had built, we could actually get a computer to write its own probabilistic programs. Interesting. So we, that's a new thing. That's not mm -hmm. really in academia. That's just a Gamelon thing. We call the underlying technology Bayesian program synthesis, but we branded it idea learning. Okay. Kind of compete with deep learning a little bit. You know, right. Good branding. So we needed a good, <laughs> we a good term. So idea learning. There's some wind behind these sales now, the deep learning. Yeah. It's interesting to see. So do you have kind of a standard way you walk folks through kind of Gaussian stuff, probabilistic programming, kind of how that all fits together? Yeah, I do. You know, you can also check out Gamelon.com. You can follow along on some of the examples that we have on the technology tab. Mm -hmm. Like one good example would be, say I wanted to make a little drawing app, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually did this in one of our hackathons at Gamelon. It's okay. pretty fun. You know, the idea is basically like, a Microsoft Surface or a tablet, you know, like, you know, you, you would want to, with your finger or stylus, you know, just draw a triangle or a square mm -hmm. or whatever. If you're like me, you're not, I'm not, I'm a terrible artist. So mm -hmm. my squares and rectangles and triangles come out super lumpy and messed up, but the system should still be able to recognize them. And then it replaces what you drew with what you meant to draw. Okay. So I've seen there's, there are apps that do this and for yeah, the iPad, so the apps I think. That do it, they kind of, I think ours is the coolest because I mean <laughs> it was totally just a toy. Like it's not a product. Right, it's right. just to kind of play with the technology. But but one of the things that's really satisfying about it is most of those apps, you sort of draw a triangle and it's like, oh, that's a triangle. Yeah. But then the triangle it puts there isn't the triangle you meant to draw. It just puts down like a right. 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, isosceles, 60 yeah. flat on the bottom, <laughs> you know, st standard size. So it's not right. really your triangle. It's their triangle right. that they, you know, <laughs> so our app puts, it's not an app, our experiment, yeah. prototype hackathon thing, but it's a good pedagogical tool. It puts your triangle nice. for you. Okay. So, I get it. so the way it does that. So I'm going to just take you through what's basically a cooking recipe. You can do a cooking recipe on a podcast, right? Like take two eggs sure. and some flour. Yeah. So it's going to be like that. Nice. So what we're going to do is a cooking recipe to draw a triangle. Okay. All right. So triangle has three corners. You know, we're going to have to pick a, a X, Y coordinates for the first corner of the triangle because this is going to be a random triangle. The corners could be all over the place. It could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. So we're going to pick those at random. So let's pick the first triangle. Maybe we're doing this. I'm going to date myself, but this is going to be a 1024 by 768 <laughs> JPEG image or something, right? I'm going to draw this triangle. So we're going to pick a number between 1 and 1024, mm -hmm. and that's going to be the X coordinate. And I'm going to pick another number at random between 1 and 768, mm -hmm. I guess 0 and 767 <laughs> on the uh, vertical axis. So we pick that first coordinate, and then we're going to pick a second coordinate. We have two points, and we mm -hmm. draw a line between them. Mm-hmm. And then, okay, so now we got a line, mm -hmm. right, with two ends. And then pick a third point, and mm -hmm. we draw another line. Mm -hmm. Now we got almost a triangle, and then we just got to bring it on home, mm -hmm. close the triangle, draw the last line. We didn't need any new points. We just need to connect to the, the opening. Mm -hmm. So that was a good probabilistic program. We had some randomness because we picked the corners at random. Mm -hmm. We also had some determinism because we drew the lines straight right. and just, you know, they're the same every time if you tell the points – what points are at the ends, the line is the same every time. Mm -hmm. That's what probabilistic programs are good at, sort of combining randomness and determinism. Mm -hmm. 
And, and if I could ask a question yeah. about this specific app. Sure, yeah. And I'm I'm totally biased by this thing that I've seen on the iPad. Okay. Why are you picking the random points? If I'm drawing with my finger a triangle. Yeah. And I agree, I've seen the thing where it'll draw the isosceles triangle and what I drew is like nothing like that. Right, right. But why not just figure out what the, the vertices were that I drew, the corners, changes of direction, and then awesome. just draw yeah. the lines. You're asking the exact right question, right? So we've got this cookbook recipe, but we want the real corners of the triangle you meant to draw. So here's what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to take this cookbook recipe and we're going to run it over and over and over again. Mm. And every time we run it, we're going to adjust those random three corners. Mm-hmm. And move them a little. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to move them and then we're going to re-render the triangle mm-hmm. and we're going to compare it to the triangle you drew and mm-hmm. we're going to score it. And if it got better, if it got closer to the triangle that you drew, this random cookbook recipe output, mm-hmm. then we're going to keep that new set of corners. Mm-hmm. And if the corners got, if the output got worse, like it doesn't, it's moved away from being like the triangle you drew, mm-hmm. then a lot of the time we're, we're going to reject that and try again, try some new corners. Is this like some of the squares of the distances between you the vertices or something like that? You could like totally that, do that. Or, yeah, any okay. distance metric. This is the um, red light district, the seedy underbelly, <laughs> the <laughs> bad side of the railroad tracks of probabilistic programming is you always have to have a good way of scoring Yeah. at the bottom there. Yeah, mean squared error is good as any. That's basically saying, hey, I think the triangle that the cookbook output, if I add some Gaussian noise to it, it would look like your Mm-hmm. Triangle. That's really what mean squared distance lo- means mm-hmm. that, in mm-hmm. that context. So anyway, so yeah, so you can pick absolute value, L1 distance. You mm-hmm. could, and that's uh, that's another thing that's really saying there's Poisson noise between mm-hmm. your cookbook recipe and what I drew, mm-hmm. the, the real observed triangle. So anyway, so that's the south side of town. But once you get that figured out, then you can just keep adjusting those corners until it matches. Mm-hmm. And once it matches as best as it's going to, then you know you could take say the the most likely run you had of mm-hmm. the cookbook recipe. And you say, what are the corners there? And you're like, okay, I've got a set of corners. They matched as, you know, there's the best ones we found. Mm-hmm. And you could draw a triangle with those corners. Mm-hmm. You take that triangle and you draw it right on the tablet. Mm-hmm. And the person goes, wow, that looks like the triangle I meant to draw. Mm-hmm. Now, what I just described to you is totally not what we do <laughs> <laughs> because it is insane idea to run a program over right. and over and over again and adjust the parameters at right. random and hope you hit the <laughs> output, right? So that would be like, I don't know, throwing from our hotel room here at up top Manhattan, we would be throwing darts and trying to hit the Statue of Liberty or something. Yeah, yeah. So we don't actually do that, but I think that's a good way to think about it. Mm-hmm. And for simple programs, simple policy programs, you can actually do it that way. Mm-hmm. What it is, is it's a good way to think about what's happening. Mm-hmm. And what this algorithm will do is- It also though, yeah. talked on the show recently in the context of industrial applications of AI. We've talked yeah. about simulation a lot. Simulation. And what you've kind of described is this a simulator. This is a simulator, right? right? This right. is a simulator. So what are you, you just did, you just simulated where your data came from. Right. This is a story or, in fact, the way we usually teach this to new employees or new people that we're trying to teach it to is we say- Oh, you have some data and you mm-hmm. want to do machine learning on it. Mm-hmm. You want to do probabilistic programming on your data. Okay. Well, the first thing you should do is in English, get out your literary cap mm-hmm. and your quill pen and write down in English the story of how you think your data came to be, hmm. right? Which is a simulation. It's a simulation mm-hmm. of the system that made your data, mm-hmm. whether that's a biological thing, you know, this right. is heartbeats data or whether that's financial data or whatever. And the characters in your story, those are going to be the variables in your probabilistic program. Mm -hmm. And then the things they do, the actions they take are going to be some of the determinism, like like the straight lines we drew. Hmm. And if they have choices to make, those are going to be, could be random coin flips or dice rolls in your Mm -hmm. probabilistic program. You know, if you knew exactly your system, if you could deterministically simulate it, it wouldn't be a probabilistic program, it would be a regular program. Right. Okay. So the whole point of this is that there are certain things, you, you know, you have a pretty good idea of the story that created your data, but there's some stuff you're not sure about. Mm-hmm. Whatever that is, that's where you put the random variables in your probabilistic program. Mm-hmm. And then whatever those random variables are, the program's going to try as many possibilities through those random variables as it can mm-hmm. to try to match your data. And that's what gives you the fancy term, the posterior distribution. Mm-hmm. That's what tells it. You know, if I made a coin flip and, you know, if I flip the coin heads, I choose to draw a triangle. Mm-hmm. If I draw flip the coin tails, I choose to draw a square. Mm-hmm. And I've got my data, you know, 
looks like a square, mm -hmm. then if I run this over and over again, that coin flip's going to tend toward the side where the yeah, I'll put a head mm -hmm. a square. Mm -hmm. And so you'll you'll figure out that's the kind of choice that this square drawing system mm -hmm. is doing is making a lot of the time. Probabilistic programming then is you just really summarize it for us. It's kind of a methodology for programming that allows us to introduce randomness, right? And that's right. Yeah, and for si and really for simulating systems, simulating mm -hmm. systems that create data. And I think when people say probabilistic programming, they don't just mean the programming language with random variables because like Python has random variables. Mm -hmm. Technically, Python's a probabilistic programming language, but that's not what we mean in the field. We also mean the solver, the thing that tried lots of different values of the random variables and tried to find good ones. Whatever, and that was whatever that's actually that is. a segue to yeah. my next question, which is, you know, when I think about, you know, not knowing a whole lot about probabilistic programming applied, you know, when I think about how I might try to approach this, it's like, you know, Python either, you know, do, you know, get a loop and do a bunch of random stuff, yeah. you know, or get a loop and, you know, deterministically do like a brute force search of my space or something like that. Or right. Is, you know, how are you doing this, you know, or what different techniques and yeah. programming yeah. languages, platforms, frameworks, that kind of thing are you, are being used for probabilistic programming? Yeah, well, may I give you a little quick overview of, you know, three sentence overview of what people are doing in general on this. Mm -hmm. So I would say people are doing all kinds of different things. So <laughs> so some people, if they want to figure out, was it a square or a triangle? And they write a program that flips a coin. And if it's a heads, it draws a square. And if it's a tail, it draws a triangle. There's a bunch of different ways you could try to evaluate the weight of that coin. Mm -hmm. So you could run it over and over again, and that's called a sampling method. Mm -hmm. And you could do a Monte Carlo style thing there. Mm -hmm. And then within Monte Carlo methods, there's all the tons of those. There's Metropolis Hastings and important mm -hmm. sampling and Gibbs sampling and all those things. And then other people will use variational methods. And there's black box variational methods and there's mean field and there's, you know, all kinds of things there. And what are the principal differences between Monte Carlo, Sim and variational methods? If I had to like summarize it well, just like in a sentence, I would say a sampling method picks a value mm -hmm. over and over again, and a variational method fits a curve or a function. Okay. So like it's basically think of a, a regular old Gaussian distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And how did it get made? Well, well, say there's some, your data actually has a real Gaussian distribution mm -hmm. and you want to fit that. So one thing you could do is you could pick a mu, pick a sigma, mm -hmm. draw the curve, mm -hmm take the mean squared error to the right. actual data. Didn't get it right. Okay. Adjust a little, keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Keep moving the mean, keep moving the sigma until it fits. Mm -hmm. That's a variational method. Okay. Cause what you did was you changed some parameters of this curve and fit the curve. model and you're yeah. trying to fit the model. Fitting a curve is basically okay. a variational yeah. method. And then the other way you could do it is Monte Carlo method, which is you could just sample a bunch of samples from a Gaussian with some mean invariance and mm -hmm. then compare the histogram you got to the data. Mm -hmm. And keep adjusting the parameters of the of where you're sitting. So one way to do it, you know, the, in the science museum, they get those pegboards, mm -hmm. and the ping pong balls fall down, and they make mm -hmm. a Gaussian pile mm -hmm. at the bottom, right? So you could, you know, you could change the spacings of the pegs in mm -hmm. there until it. That would be a more like a sampling method, mm -hmm. and get, you know, change all the maybe there's biases of those pegs, like they okay. could push the balls more to the right or the left, you get a skew, okay, stuff like that. So. You know, so there's all different kinds of ways to f to sort of fit variables to data in a probabilistic program, and I would say the community is in this massive exploration mm -hmm. of of ways to do it. Another way is gradient based methods, which is what's usually done in neural networks. You can do backpropagation through a probabilistic program hmm. using auto differentiation methods, and there's a bunch of papers on that. Okay. What we do at Gamelon is a little different. We sort of look at each of these core methods as, or even some of their subcomponents, like taking a gradient, as kind of like an atom or a subatomic particle or like an amino acid, like a building block. Mm -hmm. And then what our system does is kind of evolves solvers on the fly to do the best job of solving the probabilistic program you throw at it. Hmm. So it's a pretty complex so piece that, of engineering. Yeah, what does that mean? Does that mean that the system knows about some 
you know, a handful of archetypal solvers and it kind of picks one and fits its parameters or is it it's kind of like more evolutionary than that. It's more evolutionary than that. It's kind of like doing some approximation of what maybe a human mathematician who wanted to design a solver for a model Mm -hmm. would do. You know, they would. What's the cookbook for that? There's no good cookbook, right? (laughs) In fact, there's a theorem that says there's no good cookbook. It's called the no free lunch theorem. Okay. Which basically says, given a problem, Mm -hmm. there's no one solver that will solve all problems best. Mm. So every problem, you know, they're definitely always going to be a, for any given problem, you know, you might, there might be a general class of methods that work pretty well, but mm-hmm. better than some other class of methods. And, mm-hmm. the, but that class of methods would work that worked well on that problem could work terribly on some other problem. Mm-hmm. So just, there's no guarantees, right? That a particular solver will be particularly good on a particular probabilistic mm-hmm. program. So you really just have to try stuff, mm-hmm. which is what humans do. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at like, you know, NIPS, the conference or mm-hmm. AI stats or any of these conferences. You kind of look through a lot of the papers historically, like somebody said, here's a model I invented. I mm-hmm. want to solve, you know, this problem. I wanted to, I don't know, cluster documents by topic mm-hmm. or something. And then, okay, this model was hard to solve. Mm-hmm. So I had to spend a year of grad school or two years or five mm-hmm. years figuring out a solver method that would work on it. Right. And sometimes for very complex models, people cobble together a couple of different solver methods for different parts of the model. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at the end of grad school, they get it working and they publish their paper. Yeah. And, you know, if you're real good, you can do one of those a year. (laughs) And so most papers are are a choice of a model and a choice of a solver kind of mated. Uh And what we're trying to do is automate that. You know, we're trying to, I guess, automate grad school. It's funny. (laughs) It's funny that you describe it like that. Uh, I spent a lot of time and have asked a bunch of folks on the podcast about, you know, trying to understand deep neural network architectures and how do folks get to Mm -hmm. Google Net or, you know, one of these kind of, how do you arrive at that? Yeah. And the best explanation, the best sarcastic explanation that I heard recently was gradient descent by graduate student. And there's right. an acronym for it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. But here's a non-sarcastic, because there's a theorem for that too, uh-huh. which is if a model is at its core a simulation of where your data came from, mm-hmm. think about what that re- what a synonym is for that. Another synonym for that is scientific theory. Mm. A scientific theory, a good one, is a very clean, accurate simulation of where your data came from, mm-hmm. whether it's a black hole or a mitochondria or something. Right. And a good scientific theory will, you know, fit the data. It'll predict future events. It'll do Mm -hmm. all these things. Great. Because it's a great simulation. It really models the system well. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that the space of scientific theories is super exponential. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of them. There's way more than even NP complete. Right. Right. So the search for scientific theories is by its definition a computationally hard exercise. Like Mm. there's never going to be, well, we hope there's not going to be a polynomial time algorithm (laughs) that just gives, well, there'd be some pros and cons. So if there was like a fast, you could run on your laptop and it could find a scientific theory to fit any data. If that algorithm existed, the good news is science, we'd know all science, right? Right. Any data we got from anything, we'd understand it immediately. Science would be done. That'd be kind of cool in a way. (laughs) Problem is if the aliens come. Mm-hmm. If the aliens come, they probably discovered this too. How'd they get here? They had like really good science. They mm-hmm. figured out faster than light speed travel. And they're really not interested in our culture, right? Mm-hmm. They don't want to hear about our science and our theorems and trade because we came up with different ones because mm-hmm. it's hard. Like they already have them all because they have this polynomial time algorithm. So the only reason they're here is for our water and our, you know, probably going to eat us or something. <laughs> so that would be, so we, most of us hope that there's no uh, polynomial time algorithm for finding good models. <laughs> you don't so. think there are benevolent aliens that just want to explore the universe and make friends? Well, if they have, <laughs> if they have all theorems, why don't they stay home, right? Like, there's, there's no point. <laughs> then anything we would say would be boring to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> they could simulate, they could make a theory of everything about the earth. They could just have culture. us running in an aquarium in simulation. And yeah, just, exactly. Yeah, why, right? why come all the way why out here? Why bother? Yeah, yeah. interesting. Uh, I guess that's the other alternative is we would be, if they had this algorithm, then we would be that simulation. Right, so, right. Yeah, so. I need to get, Elon, you, if <laughs> anyone has a connection with Elon Musk so I can get him on to talk about this, you know, we are a simulation <laughs> theorem, make it happen. 
<laughs> so the the triangle example I think is is interesting and illustrative because it's of its simplicity, mm-hmm. but it's not satisfying mm-hmm. because it doesn't tell me where I would use this and and mm-hmm. more specifically, I guess, what are the classes of problems for which this Gaussian approach is better than any of the other things that I would have otherwise tried to do? And by the way, it's much more than Gaussians. Like we use all kinds of different random distributions and probabilistic programs and also the determinism. So in fact, so probabilistic, probabilistic programs, programming is more – Much more than Gaussians, than Gaussian, right? right? Because in fact, we can express any probability distribution. Probabilistic programs are sort of Turing complete, if you will, for describing probability distributions. And okay. They can make any probability distribution, any space. Okay. So here is where we should probably make a distinction between the model and the solver. Mm-hmm. So on the model side – a probabilistic program can express a model of any data. It's a great scientific tool. It's a great, you know, I mean, what if all scientific theories were written in a clear stochastic lambda calculus? So across mm-hmm. all different so- branches of the sciences, we could all just have this clear language that we could trade our theories in. Mm-hmm. So I mean, someone once said, you know, Bayesian modeling is, oh, you know who it was? It was Pedro Domingos. Mm-hmm said to me, you know, the Bayesian tribe think they're the right, they're doing things the right way. He wrote the um, master, master algorithm. algorithm right? yeah. yeah. Because it, Bayesian is like clearly the kind of quote, the like correct way, you know, you should right. need like a British accent to like express, <laughs> express a theory mm-hmm. of anything. It, you know, probability theory is the theory of uncertainty. Like this is the right way to do mm-hmm. it. But of course, all but the simplest Bayesian models are computationally intractable to solve. Mm-hmm. And so- you know, I think people who are in other tribes like neural networks would say, well, you know, we restricted ourselves to a set of probabilistic programs that you can use gradient based methods on. Mm-hmm. And that's how we're getting all these great results. Mm-hmm. And so we would say, oh, great. Gradient methods sound good to us. We're incorporating that into our probabilistic programming solver platform mm-hmm. along with all these other methods. Mm-hmm. And when they come in handy, we'll use them. Mm. And so. We do everything that TensorFlow does. In fact, our system, like David Bly's system at Columbia, Edward actually is built on top of TensorFlow. So it's so a probabilistic, a probabilistic programming, programming system on, on top of TensorFlow. Okay, interesting. And yeah, that's so David Bly. David Bly, B L E I. Okay, David Bly. Brilliant faculty member at Columbia University and good colleague. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, there, there are some architectural limitations in using TensorFlow, but you get the benefit of, you know, this open source project that has a lot of good momentum and energy behind it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, probably the takeaway is it's, it's not an either or, but I like to start my design flow when I'm thinking about machine learning with a probabilistic program, with a, an English story Mm -hmm. in English with my quill pen of where my data came from, Mm -hmm. because I think it helps you do model discovery by uh, graduate student grading descent to know <laughs> what that generative story is of your data. Mm-hmm. That's a good starting point. So can you maybe walk us through that design thinking process for a uh, application that you've applied this to? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to think of one. Yeah. I mean, so think about enterprise data dirt. You're trying to clean up enterprise data. Mm-hmm. So you can think about, well, what are all the ways that data gets corrupted? Mm-hmm. Oh, it gets abbreviated. Mm-hmm. So someone deleted some letters. Mm-hmm. Gets permuted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of things you could, you know, sat down for a half hour with your friend right. and brainstormed ways that data could get corrupted. Mm-hmm. You could write all those down, and then you could make a story of data dirt. Okay. So that would be an example. Mm-hmm. There's a really beautiful example. My friend Julian at MIT who used he didn't actually use a probabilistic programming system because they didn't exist at the time yet, but essentially did this for finding exoplanets. Hmm. So an exoplanet is a planet that is circling a star, Mm -hmm. you know, in a a distant, not galaxy, but distant solar system. Mm -hmm. And he found clouds Hmm. on a planet that was a thousand light years away. Wow. And he did that by writing a story. So he used Kepler space telescope to receive the data. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a story of where the data came from. You know, the light came from the star. It had to pass through the atmosphere of the solar of the planet, and then it had to disperse, you know, through the and scatter through through molecules in its mm-hmm. atmosphere, and then it had to then disperse through the traversal to Kepler, and then mm-hmm. Kepler's optics. You had to model all that, mm-hmm. and so he went from that to 
all the way back to what was the density of the atmosphere at different locations on the planet, hmm. just inverting that that model. Mm -hmm. And he had all kinds of different solver methods. So the orbital dynamics were continuous variables. He did gradient descent on those. Okay. But the I think the distribution over the scattering, that stuff was deterministically done because they had put hot gases into a kiln and they knew their scattering properties at very mm. high densities and temperatures. And so, you know, that was like a deterministic system with some parameters that needed to be Markov chain Monte Carlo sampled. All these things kind of cobbled together. Mm. So doing that kind of science, I think astrophysics is a really great example. You know, th that's the kind of thing you can do really beautifully with mm -hmm. the probabilistic programming. And so in in one of the cases that that you see on the enterprise side, whether it's this dirty data problem or something else, like so you've you start out, you write out your problem in English, mm -hmm. like what next? Where how do you evolve that to a solution? We translate it into Python. Okay. So you just take your English and turn it into a Python simulation. And that did you mention DSL earlier? You have a descriptive language for doing this or No, we just use Python. Oh, so, just straight up so, Python. Okay. You know, if you look at a, what we call Particle as our probabilistic programming platform, okay, an idea learning platform, get to idea learning at the end here. The simulations are just straight up Python, and you can do anything you can you can do in Python. If you have a science library or a business process thing that you wrote that simulates part of your business process or whatever, mm -hmm. you can just you know patch that right in. Python's a great glue language, so it makes mm -hmm. a really great way of putting together a simulation. Mm -hmm. And so that's the first step is is you just build that Python model of your data and it should spit out random data, kind of nonsense data, but it should look statistically like your real data. Mm -hmm. So you've got a problem, you model your problem in English, you create a Python version of your model, yep. what we're calling a simulation here. Yep. And I think, I guess what is interesting here is you're not, this Python isn't trying to solve your problem. It's just trying to model your problem. That's what's different than like traditional approaches. And then yes. you kind of apply the solver to that. And exactly. it kind of back, yes. it works backwards, it works backwards to backwards. figure out what That's the actual right. model is. The, to the actual parameters right. are. Yeah, right. Okay. Exactly. Oh, what we call the posterior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, very interesting. So it's a very rational design flow. Mm -hmm. You know exactly what you put into your model and you know exactly what you left free for the solver to noodle mm -hmm. with. So on that last point, one of the big challenges in applying neural networks to you know, problems that matter, if mm -hmm. you will, is explainability. Yeah. Does the approach that we're talking about here, because you, you know your model better, does that lead to better results from an explainability perspective or are there still challenges there? I mean, it gives you a knob you can turn from perfect explainability mm -hmm. to the same situation you're in with a neural network. Okay. So a neural network is just a probabilistic program. You can write it. Right. A probabilistic <laughs> program, a neural network written as a probabilistic program is flip these million coins. Uh huh. Now multiply their heads and tails by some weight, some weight which uh -huh. you sampled from a Gaussian. Right. And then add them. Some number of add times. That, uh, yeah. Right. Do all that. You know how that looks. And then add them up and do the sigmoids and then get a, yeah. make that be the weight of another batch of coins, Okay, the weights of another batch of coins. And that's the uh -huh. next layer of the neural network. So there's your neural network as a probabilistic program. Okay. So you can do that. That's a pretty, you know, you can run that model. You can train it on data. You can use mm -hmm. backprop in the probabilistic program as the solver. And now you're just doing TensorFlow. You're doing neural network. Right, right. So, so in fact, TensorFlow is, is a probabilistic programming language. It's just one that only has Bernoulli variables, Gaussian variables, and gradient descent solver. Okay. It's just very limited probabilistic programming system. Okay. And it only can express models which tend to be not very explainable because that there's no deterministic code. You can't really put any ideas in there. Mm -hmm. But we can turn a knob all the way over to a super explainable model if you want to, mm -hmm. like a very causal model, mm -hmm. where if you know you flip a coin to decide whether the person was crossing the street, and you flip a coin to decide whether the bus was coming at that same time, mm -hmm. and then if they were crossing the street and the bus was coming at the same time, they get hit by the bus, mm -hmm. else they don't. And then you sample the statistics of people getting hit by buses and like, Someone get hits by gets hit by a bus. You go in the model and you say like, why do you think they got, you know, we're likely to get hit by a bus? And it's like, oh, look, you know, is very likely the way you set it up. It was very likely <laughs> for them to cross the street when the bus was coming. Right, right. 
it's kind of a morbid example, but <laughs> but <laughs> super explainable, super simple. You know, you can make them. Uh, well, did you know, happen to see the video on Twitter of the bus that hit the guy and the guy like bounced off the bus and got up? This happened today, and I think in the UK somewhere. I'm so glad that. So that's what happens in this prostate program. Is every time someone does get hit by a bus, he just bounces off. Everybody's fine. It's great. And there's a hundred percent probability of that <laughs> happening, uh, <laughs> which is good. So yeah, so so what you do is you you get a knob, and mm -hmm. the knob is what we call a model capacity knob. So the neural network is of extreme. It's a universal function approximator. It's a super wide variance model. Mm -hmm. It can, if with enough training data, it can be do me anybody, mm -hmm. be anybody it wants to be. Right? It can mm -hmm. learn any to fit any data. Mm -hmm. And it's totally unexplainable and it takes a ton of data to, or very unexplainable and it takes a, a ton of data to train it. Mm -hmm. And as you turn this knob toward narrower variants, mm -hmm. you get models which are tighter, more deterministic, more understandable, more explainable. Mm -hmm. And if they're the right model, they also take a lot less data to, to fit and they mm -hmm. also make much better predictions. Mm -hmm. If they're the wrong model, if they're biased, then you got a problem. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second thing. In addition to making this really fancy solver system for our the second thing our system has is a bunch of – it's basically the first IDE for probabilistic programming. Hmm. Okay. So it lets our staff basically get a lot of the kinds of profiler and debugger feedback, kind of the analogy to profiler and debugger feedback that you'd get from regular programming. Mm -hmm. So it tells you, you know, is this line of code helping fit your data or hurting you when you try to fit your data? Hmm. Is it helping your solver converge or is it hurting you with your solver convergence? Hmm. Things like that. Wow. And it, that's super important. We need development tools for machine learning next. We, mm -hmm. you know, like take TensorFlow, you know, it doesn't give you a ton of feedback when your model is the wrong model. Mm -hmm. You mentioned wanting to get to idea learning. Oh, idea learning. Yeah. So that's our kind of new aha at Gamelon. And I don't know if we have really time to get into it, but the simple idea is that instead of inputting the probabilistic programs by probabilistic programmers programming probabilistically, you just talk to the system <laughs> okay. and tell it stuff and mm -hmm. it interprets what you're telling it as a probabilistic program. Mm -hmm. And so you can insert ideas into the middle of it. So it'd be as if you could talk to TensorFlow in English and have it adjust its weights, hmm. not in terms of supervised or unsupervised data, but in terms of like, it would almost be like saying, hey, TensorFlow, I want weight number 219 to be 1.3. Mm -hmm. You'd be adjusting the insides of it. Hmm. Of course, that one doesn't make a lot of sense in the case of a neural network, but in the case of the kinds of models we build, you can actually have a pretty nice little conversation with your system. Hmm. You know, so the analogy here is you know, training a dog. Mm -hmm. So Pavlovian conditioning, right? If you want a normal supervised neural network, whatever, machine learning, you ring the bell, mm -hmm. you show the food, the meat, delicious meat, the dog salivates, you do that mm -hmm. over and over again. Now the dog salivates every time they hear the bell, mm -hmm. right? So what did you do? You basically give it – it's just like when we teach TensorFlow how to recognize a cat. You show a picture of a cat. Mm -hmm. You say, this is a cat. If it gets it right, then you reward it with back right. prop. If it gets it wrong, you punish it. It's the same thing, stimulus and a response. <laughs> and then you coerce it to give you the right response for the – desired response for mm -hmm. the stimulus. You do that over and over again. With a dog, it's like 12 repetitions with a – <laughs> TensorFlow, it tends to be, you know, 30,000 cat images or whatever, right. labeled data points for each category. And that's how we ordinarily train. But when we, with a human, you know, with my kids, you know, when I want them to come for dinner, you know, and then this is the summer now. So we got, mm -hmm. they're out playing. So we got the dinner bell mm -hmm. and you just say, look, this is the dinner bell. And when I ring it, that means dinner's ready and you should come. And, you know, normal <laughs> people would hear that once. And they would just come to the dinner. They don't need repetitions. They're not heavy in learning stimulus right. responses. We're not conditioning right. them. Right. I mean, if you're my kids, you have to repeat yourself like three or four times. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, what did you, you did something different. You didn't put in input output stimulus response and train that. What mm -hmm. you did was you stuck an idea in their head in between the input and the output right in there, like inception mm -hmm. by talking to them. Mm -hmm. So that's what we need for machine learning <laughs> because there's no way we're going to just like, how do you build modern civilization if humans could only train each other through stimulus and response? It's, it's right. nuts. That's crazy. This isn't going to work. Right. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Great. Well, what's the, uh, for folks that want to learn more about this, you've mentioned the Gamelon website is one place. 
Are there other... If you want to play with models, you don't even have to install any software. There's probmods.org, P-R-O-B. Okay. M-O-D-S. I guess prob stands for probabilistic. I don't know what mod stands for. Models. Models. Yeah. .org. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of good examples. That's Josh Tenenbaum, Noah Goodman, Vikashman Singa, some others collaborated okay. on that. It's fun to play with because it's all in JavaScript. I think it's it's all in the browser. Mm-hmm. So you just literally go to this webpage and you can live play with probabilistic programs and edit them and, oh, wow. and run them. So it's kind of a nice starting awesome. point. Any papers that are seminal in this well, area? Yeah, there's, the, there's a lot of seminal papers and I would say go play. The papers are really pretty tough to read. Really? They tend to combine programming languages, semantics with compiler theory, with heavy Bayesian <laughs> math and everything in between. And this is going to be an expert in like three different terrible vocabularies, mathematical okay. notations. So yeah, I think playing is, is okay. maybe the, could be more fun. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's so great to have you on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, everyone, that is our show. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued support, comments, and feedback. A special thanks goes out to our series sponsor, Intel Nirvana. If you didn't catch the first show in this series where I talked to Naveen Rao, the head of Intel's AI product group, about how they plan to leverage their leading position and proven history in silicon innovation to transform the world of AI, you're going to want to check that out next. For more information about Intel Nirvana's AI platform, visit intelnirvana.com. Remember that with this series, we've kicked off our giveaway for tickets to the AI conference. To enter, just let us know what you think about any of the podcasts in this series or post your favorite quote from any of them on the show notes page, on Twitter, or via any of our social media channels. Make sure to mention at Twimmel AI at Intel AI and at the AI Conf so that we know you want to enter the contest. Full details can be found on the series page. And of course, all entrants get one of our slick Twimmel laptop stickers. Speaking of the series page, you can find links to all of the individual show notes pages by visiting twimmelai.com slash OReillyAINY. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.